Well, I'm going to talk here about obsidian and how it represents the spread of agriculture into the Western Mediterranean. Uh, unlike what we've seen in uh, Anatolia and elsewhere, uh, where things are not all at the same time, what we see when you get to Italy and further west, a real Neolithic package, the domesticated animals, the domesticated plants, and the beginning um, of uh, obsidian transport and trade all at the same time. Uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the methods of analysis that we use uh, today, uh, also specifically about uh, uh, obsidian subsources so that we can be very specific about where the obsidian is coming from, how it is acquired, and how that represents different kinds uh, of socioeconomic organization. Um, and in the central Mediterranean, we already know, based on the uh, plant and animal finds and so on, uh, ceramics, uh, what's called the cardial impressed ware, the cardial pottery culture, uh, which spreads mostly in the coastal area of southern France, uh, Croatia, the boot and all of Italy, uh, and a little bit into Spain, and a kind of drawing line between that area and the, and the part further east into Greece uh, uh, and Albania and so on. Obsidian has been found literally in more than a thousand different archaeological sites. Uh, we have several different sources, all on islands here in the central Mediterranean. Tiny islands of Palmarola, Pantelleria, and Lipari, and then the large island of Sardinia. Uh, and so, obviously, in a whole lot of places here, there's the potential for the obsidian coming from different sources uh, that are quite a good distance away. I always have to thank Colin Renfrew and colleagues for their early studies, uh, which generally came up with a kind of geographic thing that you would have estimated to begin with, where Sardinian obsidian is more here in the western part of the central Mediterranean, whereas the Lipari obsidian is largely in the eastern part. Palmarola obsidian, uh, we know the quantity and quality and some other characteristics uh, uh, suggested that it would not be as widely distributed as the other sources. I'm not going to get into the different kinds of analytical methods that are used today. Uh, obsidian sourcing is fairly straightforward. We can use 10 different kinds of instruments to do this, uh, uh, but being able to do non-destructive analysis with the portable XRF machines uh, allows me to go and visit many different museums, do the analyses on the spot very quickly and non-destructively, so everybody is happy as far as uh, uh, that goes. Uh, and again, we can clearly distinguish uh, the different sources there, Lipari, Palmarola, different Sardinian groups, Pantelleria, Milos over in the Aegean, Carpathian sources, and so on. Again, this is something that at this point is very straightforward. Uh, it is important uh, to not just say that the obsidian came from Sardinia or Lipari or elsewhere uh, because there are different subsources. And this says something when we can identify those specific locations, we can address things, for example, like territorial control, which is something that we probably don't see in the early Neolithic, but by the later Neolithic, uh, I argue that that is definitely in place, that you have specialists. Uh, producing obsidian in very specific locations and being able to identify that specific subsource uh, for the artifacts that are distributed allows us to assess uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and I've done myself a geological survey on these different islands, and so we can identify, uh, for example, Canetto Dentro in this small little outcrop here, uh, whereas in the Gabalato area, uh, there are different outcrop areas. Uh, unfortunately, Lipari was largely covered over uh, by historic volcanic events, uh, so that the, both the archaeological sites and some of the source locations here uh, are, are just simply cannot be uh, uh, studied as well as we would like. Uh, but in any case, as you can see here, I can go and distinguish between the Canetto Dentro, two different Gavilato Gorge groups, and then another source that simply does not produce very large pieces of obsidian, so we can kind of exclude that uh, one uh, to begin with. Uh, going to Sardinia, uh, uh, again, there are different outcrops uh, uh, and so on that can be distinguished chemically uh, uh, and different qualities, different other characteristics, which are important when we consider how people were going and when you have multiple choices, are they making selections for certain kinds of reasons? color, uh, the size of the raw blocks, the accessibility of the material, uh, and, and so on.
And again, we can easily distinguish these different subsources on Sardinia. Uh, so at this point in time, uh, about 16,000 obsidian artifacts have been tested here in the central Mediterranean, ranging from the Neolithic through the Bronze Age time periods. And so this gives us a lot of data uh, where we can potentially go and look uh, at changes over time and how that represents uh, the sociocultural, political, economic aspects of the different uh, societies. Uh, and uh, you all know what obsidian looks like. Um, and uh, technology is another thing that changes over time, and we have to integrate that with the use of materials from different sources uh, uh, as well. And the um, uh, evolution of production, whether this is something that is more on a casual basis uh, or whether you have specialists doing these kinds of things. So with my colleagues, we have analyzed obviously quite a large number uh, of pieces and are doing the technotypology as well as uh, uh, the sourcing. Okay, at this point, uh, coming from the source island of Lipari over here, uh, pieces of obsidian from that source are found throughout Italy, into southern France, uh, into Tunisia, <coughs> uh, uh, and, and so on. And this is starting right away in the early Neolithic, and that just says something about the rapidity uh, 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 of the spread of agriculture in these coastal kinds of areas uh, around the Mediterranean that it happens uh, uh, so fast. Uh, one of the things that I argue for uh, is that this is a northern, northern, northwestern spread of the obsidian from Lipari going this way. There's a reason that I'm not showing any place over uh, to the east of here, because at this point, only one single piece of Lipari obsidian has been found to the east of this line. So the spread of the obsidian is very much in the same direction as the spread of agriculture. And why is that? Uh, they clearly were able to go uh, uh, out in uh, whatever kinds of boats or vessels uh, going from these source islands uh, and in fairly significant uh, open water travel from the beginning of the early Neolithic. So why are they not going in the opposite uh, uh, direction? Here in Sicily, uh, uh, among the analyses that are done here, there's different percentages of the two major sources, Pantelleria, which is to the southwest, and Lipari over here. Again, there are differences in the quality uh, 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 and quantity of these kinds of materials. Um, and it's no surprise that the Pantelleria obsidian is found much more in the western half uh, of Sicily. Um, uh, but one of the very interesting cases I want to show is the island of Malta. Uh, or the country of Malta and the two separate islands of Gozo and Malta, uh, which is also really in the open water area and tells us something about the capability they had for maritime transport. And that is uh, that at the site of Scorba, which is more of a residential as well as ritual site, most of the obsidian being found there is coming from Lipari. Whereas at the site of Shara uh, on Gozo, most of the obsidian is coming uh, from Pantelleria instead. So there is definitely some kind of selection of these materials. Um, uh, and that one, of course, is not in the direction of agricultural spread, but the only way you're going to go from Malta is from Sicily to begin with. Um, at the site of Ustica, this is a tiny island, five square kilometers. Uh, uh, there's actually six different archaeological sites, one of which at least dates back to the very beginning of the early Neolithic. Uh, and most of the obsidian found there is coming from Lipari, whereas at the sites over here uh, in uh, the northwestern part of Sicily, where you would think boats would be going to get uh, up to Ustica, uh, have less of the, uh, have, have a different percentage of the Pantelleria versus the Lipari obsidian. And so this um, uh, supports my hypothesis that there was more direct travel between these islands than going to the nearest coastal areas, then across the coast, and then back up to another island. And by analyzing literally hundreds and hundreds of artifacts, uh, we can do these kinds of percentages and predict uh, uh, these distributions. Uh, I already said something about uh, uh, the difference between the Brockdorf Circle and, and Scorba on Malta, so move along. Uh, and I also said something uh, about that site of Ustica here. Now, at the same time that I argue that they uh, were doing pretty well in open water travel 8,000 years ago, uh, oh, people bring up questions. What about going all the way from Ustica or from Sicily over to Sardinia? 
We had no evidence whatsoever of that. Well, what kind of evidence would we have? Would be pottery and obsidian, the main materials found in the archaeological record. Uh, and this strongly suggests that when possible, people followed coastal routes, more or less, be able to see your destinations and so on. Uh, and at the same time, we actually have found now some obsidian objects, one piece, one piece only, in Sicily, uh, and small numbers in the southern part of Italy. But I will show you shortly um, uh, a map showing that that's really the end of the down-the-line trade, making it that far south from Sardinia. So there were limits uh, in, in the maritime transport that they had at that time. Uh, the different subsources are very important in Sardinia uh, uh, because we have shown uh, that the use of those sources changes over time. The very first study that I did 25 years ago uh, showed that they were mostly using uh, a variety in the earlier Neolithic, and then it became dominant using the Sardinian Sea subsource uh, by the late Neolithic. And after analyzing this for many other sites uh, in Sardinia and Corsica, again, in the early Neolithic, uh, we find the use of those major groups, A, B, and C. But then in the late Neolithic, they're not using the B uh, as much, and it becomes dominated at most of these places uh, by the Sardinian Sea. And what we have gone and done is an actual excavation near the Sardinian Sea uh, subsource uh, uh, area uh, uh, and discovered actual major workshops where they were collecting the raw material uh, and producing uh, literally right on the spot more than two meters down. Uh, here's a pile of the debitage for major production that clearly was far more than would ever be used by the people living nearby. This is something uh, that you had specialists producing here and trading uh, and sending this off to uh, uh, places much further away, including into Corsica to the north, uh, uh, and have looked at different varieties and things uh, there as well. Uh, here I'm showing uh, in these uh, large red dots, these are finds now of Sardinian obsidian in the southern half of Italy in the one piece in Sicily. But these are, you know, we could take all of these pieces and put them in, you know, the palms of my hand here compared uh, to the great quantities, the high percentage of the overall lithic assemblage uh, that is coming from Sardinian obsidian, not just on that island, but in Corsica and getting onto the mainland here as well. Uh, Lipari obsidian, uh, though, travels even further than the Sardinian obsidian. Uh, here we are in the uh, central part of the Adriatic, uh, and we find obsidian at many of the archaeological sites here, in significant quantities still, uh, but it's also traveling across the Adriatic, which is probably the opposite difference of the spread of agriculture. Total separate area of my research uh, is looking at uh, the early arrival of domesticates right here in this part of central southern uh, Italy, uh, not one of the previous hypotheses that people travel mostly over land up to the top of the Adriatic and then back down the peninsula. Uh, and this is based, of course, on radiocarbon dates and so on. Uh, uh, and it does help that there are some islands in between, uh, some of which were also occupied uh, going back into the early Neolithic period. Um, and one of the things uh, also to mention uh, is on one of these islands, we actually do find uh, some pieces of Milo subsidian coming all the way from the Aegean. But this has nothing to do with the spread of agriculture because these show up later in time at the very end uh, of, the, of the Neolithic. Uh, heading a little bit north here uh, into central Italy at the site of Poggio Olivastro, uh, uh, looking at the different percentages. We have clear competition, if you will, uh, between Lipari, Palmarola and the different Sardinian subgroups here. Uh, but also consider, this is an inland site. So you have the travel, obviously, from one of the islands then to the coast, uh, uh, from where the sources are um, on Sardinia to the coast of Sardinia, uh, then over water uh, to get here, and then further inland. Uh, so there's lots of people, different groups, that are probably involved in the long-distance spread of obsidian uh, during these time periods. Uh, this is a place on one of those islands in between, 
closer to Sardinia. No surprise that Sardinian obsidian is most of what's there, but there's still pieces coming from Lipari and Palmarola in the early Neolithic period. So these are not organized economic uh, uh, civilizations yet going on. Um, you know, they didn't have some exclusions or that kind of thing. People on uh, boats traveling uh, uh, some, uh, largely independently at that time. Uh, heading even further north to the site of Pescale, another early Neolithic site, uh, which is dominated uh, by Sardinian obsidian and some uh, uh, from Lipari as well. Uh, but go and compare this then with these sites not too far north and, and equally inland. You can tell from the difference in the colors here uh, that at all four of those sites, they're dominated by the Lipari obsidian and the Sardinian is only 4% uh, of the total. So how can we go and explain the selection of these totally different materials and where they're coming from? Um, uh, and something even further different uh, uh, is at these sites over in southern France, not only are they dominated by Sardinian obsidian, but specifically the Sardinian A subgroup. Whereas what we saw back in Sardinia and Corsica is it's mostly the Sardinian C group. Uh, so there's definitely things going on here, not just in the ability to travel over great distances, to have obsidian to use because it's sharper than other stone tools and, and so on, and it looks different and, and, and so forth, uh, but this really uh, involves all of these different variables into coming into some kind of conclusion. And of course, we can't just simply draw lines between uh, the uh, geological source and what we've identified by chemical analysis where it's coming from, because we know that's not the travel uh, uh, directions uh, that were going on in the Neolithic period. Um, we have to consider, again, these, these variables. I like to put them in my version of the Chen Operatoire, uh, from the archaeological site where the objects have been deposited, uh, identifying the source where it was originally acquired, and then who is it? Uh, that is going and reducing the raw material, transporting it over both uh, land-based and water-based uh, distances. What is the obsidian used for? Uh, after you chip the uh, uh, edge, is it modified and reused? Uh, these are all things to consider uh, in interpreting what was going on uh, in ancient times. Uh, uh, and just to bring up uh, uh, reasons uh, why obsidian may have been important uh, is it's very sharp. Uh, much sharper, uh, and so it's very useful for things like uh, cutting skin, cutting hair, various things like this. And uh, we do have to say that the vast majority of obsidian finds do not have obvious wear patterns. They're not being used on very hard materials, and they seem to be used very casually, that is, uh, short term. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, again, these are variables that we need to consider overall in studying obsidian. Thank you. Thank you.